Each evening before the meditation, we have the chant on goodwill. We start with a wish for happiness, for our own happiness, for the happiness of, a, of all living beings. Because that's what the Buddha's teachings are all about. A timeless happiness, a timeless well-being. So it's interesting that when the Buddha started teaching, he started with the question of suffering. He realized that by focusing on the issue of suffering, that was the, the door to that timeless well-being, a well-being that doesn't require that we have to do anything, it's not dependent on conditions, it's just there. But we have to go through the doorway of suffering in order to get there. It's right here. It's like gold buried under your house. It's good to know there's gold there, but you don't get any real use out of it unless you dig down. This is why the practice requires effort. The goal itself doesn't require effort, but uncovering all the things that cover it up, that does require effort. But it's not always a heavy effort. After all, the, the path includes right concentration, which has, among its, among its factors, a sense of ease, a sense of rapture. So we work on developing those right here in the present moment. One immediate and very visceral way of showing goodwill for yourself is in how you relate to your breath. Notice how the breath is coming in, going out right now. What does it feel like? Does it feel constricted? If it does, try to breathe in a way that feels more open. Think of the body as being like a sponge. Holes all over the surface. The breath can come in out anywhere it wants to in the body. When you keep that image in mind, you find that it changes the way you breathe. Instead of having to pull the breath in through some very thick membrane or requiring a lot of effort, you realize that it's a very easy thing to breathe. Your perception of what was getting in the way was what was actually getting in the way. The perception itself was the obstacle. So you change it, replace it with another perception. The body's like a big sponge or like a big sieve. The breath can come in out any way it wants to, any spot it wants to. It can come in and out your feet, come in and out your legs, any part of your body. Try to be friends with the breath. This is important when we're meditating, practicing concentration. We're going to be spending a lot of time with our basic objects. So you want to be on good terms with it. Don't treat it as an enemy. Don't treat it as a burden. Think of it as something liked. A friend that you're going to have a good long conversation with. Because after all, as you get to know the breath, you find that it shows you all kinds of things in the body. If you treat it right, it will open up, just like any person. If you mistreat somebody, they'll shut up close up, they won't want to bear their soul. But if you treat the person right, they'll open up. And you find that there are lots of secrets about the breath, how the breath can not actually heal illnesses in the body, how it can deal with, especially diseases that have to do with stress or strain. You can open up around that stress and strain, and you find that after a while, the gentle breathing can permeate through, loosen things up. So you, when you're sitting here with a body, you're not sitting with a, a big series of knots of tension, but it's a more open space that you have here. It's more spacious, lighter. And then just maintain that perception. As the Buddha said, states of concentration are called perception attainments.
In other words, you apply a label, whatever the label may be, that you find easy to stay with. It helps engender good sensations, comfortable sensations in the present moment, and then learn how to stay with that, stay, stay in tune with that. Because it's when you can maintain this long sense of well-being. And get a better and better sense of how to tune in. Sometimes when you're beginning, it takes a while to tune in to a sense of ease and well-being in the body. But after all, as you get more and more familiar with it, you find it easier to go right there. And you can stay there longer and longer periods of time. This is your foundation. This is what you want to build on. The breath, the breath seems less and less of a stranger. The present moment seems less and less of a stranger. You feel for, more familiar, more comfortable. At first, it's like going into a foreign city. Everything seems strange. But as you learn to negotiate, work your way around. Create a comfortable space for yourself. Then even though it started out as a foreign city, after all, it begins to feel like home. And once it feels like home, then you can really start understanding it. Understanding what's going on here in the present moment, because there is so much going on in the present. As the Buddha said, intentions keep occurring over and over and over again, right here in the present moment. And they're the main factor that shapes our experience. And yet for most of us, they lie buried underground. The major force that shapes our lives, and we're out of touch with it. So as things soften up, as they open up here in the present moment, that's what you want to look for. Look for that element of intention as it moves out, moves around. Choosing this, choosing that, emphasizing this, neglecting that. Try to get in touch with the many, many levels of intention. You see this very clearly as you're dealing with the issue of distraction in the mind. It's because you have one intention that wants to stay with the breath, and yet there are these other intentions that seem lurking around the edges, just waiting for a moment of a lapse in your mindfulness. Once it's there, they pounce on it, and all of a sudden you find yourself someplace else thinking about yesterday, thinking about tomorrow. And the question is, when did the intention to think about those other things come in? In the beginning, it's hard to see it. You realize you're there only when you're there. You realize that's when you realize what's happened. You have to work your way back. How did we get here? Well, you bring yourself back to the breath and try to be more vigilant the next time around to gain a sense of when that alternative intention moves in and suddenly takes over. This is where you realize that there are lots of different intentions in the mind, and they play games with one another, especially the intentions that you know that are not really in your best interest. They have ways of hiding, ways of putting up disguises. And the problem is we play along with them. And one of the main lessons we have to learn through the meditation is how to stop playing along. Many people have noticed when they go to Asia, the great meditation teachers are the ones who don't play along with normal games. The games that people play. It's because they've learned not to play along with the games in their own minds. So when the mind settles down and things feel quiet and still, that's the question to look for. Where are the intentions? What's the intention shaping your perceptions? How do your perceptions shape your intentions? What are the different layers of intention going on right here? Look for that. And if the issue seems muddled, we'll go back to your breath. If 
things seem clear, then you can pursue the issue. This is an important lesson in how to balance insight and concentration practice. They go together. They're part of the same thing. After all, the insight grows out of bringing the mind to stillness. You can't really bring the mind to stillness without some insight to what's going on. You can't keep it there without insight into what's going on. When the Buddha talks about tranquility and insight, he doesn't talk about them as two very separate things. He doesn't say that jhana practice or concentration practice is tranquility practice and then you work on vipassana. He says you need both tranquility and vipassana in, in order to get the mind into a state of concentration. Once it's there, then that gives both qualities even further strength. But you will notice as you're walking along the path that sometimes you lean on your left foot, sometimes you lean on the right. This is what walking is all about. You lean on the left and that allows your right foot to take a step. You lean on the right foot, that allows your left foot to take a step. In other words, sometimes you'll be leaning more in the direction of tranquility and other times more in the direction of insight. And the skill lies in learning which side to emphasize. One very basic way of testing for it is if you come across a question, say, about the intentions of the mind or the movements of the mind. As if you find that by pursuing the question, things get clearer, then you can pursue it. It's time for insight. If, however, things get muddled, it's time to back up and just try to be still. This works on every level of the practice. Because the strength of discernment requires strength of concentration. The more refined your concentration, the more solid your concentration, then the more precise your discernment can be. It's like conducting a scientific experiment. You place the, the equipment that you're going to use to measure things on a wobbly table. Well, you're going to get wobbly results. You may get a general sense of how things measure up. But if you want to be really precise, the table has to be very solid. The more solid the table, the more precise the results you get. So as you're working on the, on the mind here right now, don't ask, well, how, well, how long do I have to do concentration practice before insight comes? If you find an issue comes up, your immediate reaction should be how to keep the mind still in spite of the issue. If the issue keeps coming back again and again and again, disturbing your concentration and not allowing you to settle down, that's when you have to turn and look at the issue. Deal with it as you can, at least enough to create a little space to get the mind to settle down. Remember that as we're meditating here, there are going to be a lot of issues all around you. You could spend your whole day here worrying about Oh, different things in your life, the economy, the environment, the world political situation. There are lots of things to weigh the mind down. You can't wait for total perfection before you're going to meditate, because the world doesn't offer total perfection. What you've got to do is create a little space in the midst of a very imperfect world, a very imperfect life. So at least you've got a place to settle down. Once you've established that beachhead, then you can make it stronger, then you can make it more pervasive in your life. Which you will find involves you know, making sure that your actions are principled, they're in line with the precepts, that you don't go focusing on things that are going to excite greed, anger, and delusion. This is called restraint of the senses. that your livelihood is something you can depend on. And that you reflect on the requisites that you use. These are called the four precepts of purity. They create a larger space in your life so it's easier for the mind to settle down. In other words, reflecting on the requisites, that means looking at what you wear, what you eat, place where you live, the medicine you use, 
how much of it is really necessary and how much of it is superfluous. The more you can cut back, the more you can simplify in this area, the, the more space you'll have to meditate. At the same time, you can use the fact that the, the body's existence depends on these requisites as motivation to meditate even more, because you realize that no matter what you do in terms of your diet, how you use the other requisites, somebody's got to suffer someplace. They're suffering in getting food, they're suffering in raising food, they're suffering in being food that's being raised. If you're an animal. And even if you're a vegetarian, there's still a lot of suffering for the farmers and the transporters and the distributors and the people who work in the stores where the food is sold. This reminds you that that true happiness you're looking for, that we're working for here. You want a happiness that doesn't take anything away from anyone else doesn't create a burden for anyone else. And as long as you haven't reached there, there's still work to be done. So in the midst of this imperfect world, we try to create a space where the mind can settle in and really see what it's doing, how its attachments are causing suffering both for itself and for others, and where to look for that timeless sense of well-being. how to use your discernment, how to use your powers of concentration to keep digging down until you finally find what's buried right here in the present moment. Once you gain that, then your happiness is not dependent on things outside at all. The body can live and it's fine. If the body dies, it's still fine, because you found something that lies beyond the birth and death of the body. And it's in that way that you show true goodwill for yourself and goodwill for all beings. So we dig down right here, try to get more and more solid right here so you can get more and more familiar with, the right, with what's right here. It's through your familiarity that the real insight and the real understanding comes. They talk about awakening or enlightenment being about intimacy with all things. It's a famous quote from Dogen. It turns out it's a misquote. But still, it's an interesting thought. Intimacy is in getting familiar with your breath, getting familiar with your present moment, and then you use that intimacy to go beyond it. The intimacy is the path, it's not the goal. But you have to get very intimate with the present moment to really understand it, to work your way through all those layers of intention that hide the real gold that's right here. 